Coming up on today's Locked On Senators. Championship teams are built from the back end. We know the Sens top four is set, but today we're going to have a conversation about the bottom pair. What would make them the most competitive? And speaking of championship teams, Ross, the Stanley Cup Finals is set. The Florida Panthers are up against the Vegas Golden Knights. We'll get into all that, plus an ownership update. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome inside episode 809 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Piller up in the Blue Mountains, please like and subscribe wherever you download your podcast. We're also available on YouTube. Today is Tuesday, May 30th. And Pilsy, we still do not know who the next owner will be of the Ottawa Senators. I'm sorry. Usually I'm positive, Pilsy, but I'm going to stay pessimistic, Pilsy, on this. I wasn't expecting to know today. I'm not expecting to know tomorrow. Friday, probably not either. I've kind of given up hope on trying to pick the day that it's going to happen. So Thursday? I I wonder... (laughs) You skip skip Thursday. skip Thursday? Okay, (laughs) Thursday. It's going to be Thursday then. (laughs) Not a calendar guy. Um, but I think we could, this could honestly easily end up going into next week. As far as I'm concerned, the, the NHL is fumbling this. If you ask me first, the debacle with Ryan Reynolds dropping out of this, like that would have been so, so huge for the NHL, the kind of the little brother of all the major sports, uh, leagues in North America to get a guy like Ryan Reynolds attached to Ottawa would have been incredible that doesn't happen now bids were bids not placed weeks ago Ross and we have more bidding happening more investors being added to consortiums consortiums I don't even know the word anymore and it just seems like this is a never-ending story that should have been cleaned up long ago and I know obviously we're the locked on senators podcast so we focused on this sale more than any other team sale but I can't remember there being this much of a fuss about when the Pittsburgh Penguins were sold recently or the Nashville Predators or any of the expansion teams. Like, this is just going on and on and on. Yeah, it really is. We've, we've gone through an entire pay period since the final bids were uh, we're, we're done, eh? May 15th. We're now May 30th. So it's uh, that's talking ownership because there's not a whole lot else to say until the process is there. If you want more in-depth analysis, man, 32 Thoughts covered it and just talking about how it's kind of deteriorated into a debacle, one of our favorite kind of turn of phrases that we've probably had to use more than we would like on this show over the <laughs> years. But it's kind of ringing true as we still do not know. But we also don't know what the bottom pair is going to look like in Ottawa, and I thought that could be a better thing to focus on for today's show because we know the top four is set. It's Shabbat and Chikrin. It's Sanderson and Zub. Bang. Love that. I think a lot of Sens fans are confident with that going into the season. But there's about five names who you could realistically pencil in to the bottom pair. Maybe I'm disrespecting Eric Branstrom. He should have one of those spots locked down with the way he's played last season. Are you A, agreeable with that? And B, who would be the perfect partner for Eric Branstrom? Yeah, well, I mean, I think most people are assuming Branstrom's going to be there, but he doesn't have a contract right now. I mean, that's that's just a fact. Now, am I saying he's not going to figure it out or he's going to get traded? No, but right now, as of now, he doesn't have a contract. So we'll see how that gets sorted out in the summer. But I do think Eric Branson's play has uh, earned him a spot on this decor as long as he doesn't have a disastrous training camp or doesn't get traded. Um, So we love having the yin and yang defensive partners on our pairs, Ross, or at least I do. So Branny is your smaller, skilled, puck-moving guy. So I'd like to have someone, a veteran, that's more of a shutdown role and can play a little bit more physical. And honestly, for me, 
Travis Hamnick fits that bill almost perfectly. And I think maybe as a top four guy playing top four minutes up against other teams' top lines, he was stretched a little bit more than you'd like to see for a team that has playoff aspirations. So on a bottom pair and consistently playing with Eric Branstrom, I think could be a very effective bottom pair. Yeah, and I'll give you an argument just for, for content's sake, but I, I'm agreeable with you. And the, and the reason being, you look at the NHL Stanley Cup Finals, and we're going to do a quick Sens-style preview for the Stanley Cup Final in the next segment. But look at the bottom right side defenseman on both teams. Zach Whitecloud, Radko Gudis, both big imposing figures. White Cloud has a lot more offensive pop to his game with the way he possesses the puck through neutral ice. He's a great skater. But Nick Haig is, is the other guy, so he kind of balances it out. So each of these teams have big, mobile defensemen, and maybe Hamannick not the most mobile, but again, what he brings on the penalty kill is 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 paramount towards any sort of success. When he left the lineup uh, with 10 games left or so, the Sens had the second-worst penalty kill in the entire league, a huge drop-off from the top 10 they had maintained throughout the season with him in the mix. So I'm a huge proponent of having Travis Hamnick in the Sens lineup for more games than not next year. But I can also see a realistic scenario where he's a guy who comes in and out of the lineup a la Nick Holden from this past season. And if that's the case, then I think you might have to give it to Jacob Bernard Docker. I think that it's now or never for JBD. Could we see another step with possession of the puck? That's what I'm waiting to see in training camp. I want to see him more confident carrying the puck up through neutral ice before I'm re- ready to crown him a full-time NHLer. But defensively, he's gotten a lot better. I mean, yep. boxing out in front of his net, being able to be physical in the corners, win battles, all these types of things that will contribute to him doing what he does best. But he's one of those guys, Pilsy, that we always talk about when your A game doesn't work, what's another element that you're going to bring to be a good player? With Travis Hamannick, he's either going to be physical, but you know he's going to be able to help on the penalty kill. So that's kind of where you know if you're a coach that you can put him in pen, the first guy over the boards on the penalty kill on the back end, and you're going to be confident with that. JBD just needs to figure that out. I think he knows what his role is going forward. He knows what type of defenseman he's going to be. I think he just needs to round it all into form or be so elite at that one thing that it's impossible to ignore. Yeah, and that's a, that's the thing uh, is you got to find where he's going to fit into this decor because I had always pegged him as a guy that would be a really reliable partner for Thomas Shabbat, kind of a Dylan DeMello type, right? In a in a zoomed out lens, is he a top pair defenseman? No, neither was DeMello. But if you partner him properly with Thomas Shabbat, he can complement him and you can make it work, that kind of thing, right? So. I think JBD needs to figure out now that Shabbat has better options, not just Zaitsev and Ron Hainsey as uh, defensive partners. There's Zub, there's Chikrin, there's options. That's probably not going to be available to a guy like Jacob Bernard Docker. And the thing is, the thing why I lean more to Hamannick being on that bottom pair, and I don't think Hamannick is quite at the Holden stage of his career where you don't want him playing every night. I, I think you could have Hamannick playing every night on the bottom pair, and that would be fine. Travis Hamannick just had more points last season than he had in the last six seasons going back. He tied this when he was 25 years old at 21 points. I think people need to respect the offense a little bit more for Travis Hamannick. This guy had three more points than Eric Brantstrom this year in one less game. Yeah, it's that's definitely fair. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Like, is he in the prime of his career? No, absolutely not. But is he walking into the sunset? I don't think he's quite there yet. So I would be comfortable having him play 60 plus games in a bottom pair for sure. For for uh, comparable, Travis Hamnick will be 32, 33 years old. He turns 33 in August. So he'll be 33. Whereas Nick Holden was what, 36 or 37? This I think season. he turned 37. Last Maybe even season. just recently. I think we just posted about that. No, he just turned 36. So, yeah, he's oh. 35. So, he's three yeah. years older than Travis Hamannick. Yeah. So, I, I think that's something that can, that can work. And the thing is, still, this decor is quite young, Ross. Like, you look at Chikrin and Chabot, and you're like, oh, these are veterans. But, like, they're only in their mid-20s. Like, sure, they have a handful of NHL experience, and they're obviously pros. But 
it's and even like Zub is in his later 20s but he doesn't have that much NHL experience so it would be nice to have a guy on the back end that has you know a, a decade worth of experience playing in the NHL so I really think there's a lot of value to Hamannick and if you're not sure if he wants to come back or if he'll take a short uh, lower AAV deal just go back and listen to that interview of him talking about how much he likes being in Ottawa and I think I think he'd be willing to cut term and even some AAV to stay in this situation I think we've already talked about he's made over 30 million dollars playing NHL hockey so I Jeez. think that he's seen what a toxic environment can do just just take a peek or ask Vancouver. him about uh, ask him about being around the Canucks there for a couple of years and then look at him now. It feels like a breath of fresh air. Man, the boys are having fun with him. I don't know if you saw that content piece that the Sens put out yesterday, talking about all the music in the locker room. Right, Apparently, yeah. he's a huge Nickelback guy. So, you know, he's hanging out with noodles in the locker sure. room. Eh? <laughs> but uh, all the guys are having a laugh at that. He just seems like a guy that keeps it light. And um, basically, ask Jake Sanderson what he thinks about Travis Hamanick, and that'll tell you all you need to know about him going forward. Yeah, there's going to be a few blunders. Yeah, a lot of minor penalties, which you don't like to see on the third pair. But I think that he kind of breaks even with the good and the bad. And there's a third pair for a reason. If they didn't have anything bad, they'd probably be in the top two pairs on the back end. So it's easy to kind of poke holes on, on other guys. Like for Eric Branstrom, it's, yeah, yeah, he's a great puck mover. Well, why didn't he have as many offensive production as much offensive production as the guy to his right who's known as a penalty killer so you can go on and on about that but the bottom line and why i'm really curious why i got into this is a guy we're so high on was the fans choice on ian mendez's athletic survey that we really kind of dug into yesterday it was someone else who was covered on the third pair we're going to give you that answer and discuss it next you're listening to locked on senators Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Athletic Greens. Ross, I know you're on the Athletic Greens train as well. I'm, I'm having on a blast. It. Isn't yeah. it good? It's solid. And I, I've really come to enjoy the taste. Like now, my mindset has shifted from, oh, this is something healthy for me. Like I better have it to, oh, nice. I'm going to start my day off with my AG1 from Athletic Greens because the taste is really growing on me. And with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and more. This special blend of ingredients supports so many things. Your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of these things, and it's lifestyle friendly. So whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, and it tastes great. And that's going to support your sleep quality, recovery, mental clarity, and alertness. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do, simple. Go to athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance from Athletic Greens. Today's episode is also brought to you by Owl & Co. Grooming. Woohoo! Owl and Co. Grooming started. I still don't think you have that owl noise uh, down, but that was better. Oh, <laughs> Owl and Co. Grooming is awesome. We just had Chris Sinclair on the show last week. You can really feel the passion of just wanting to make sure that everyone feels better about themselves, and that starts with a morning grooming routine that doesn't suck. Woohoo! Whether you're a guy looking to take care of your epic beard or a woman looking to add more nourishment to your hair, check out the starting lineup at Owl & Co. Grooming. Hair tonic, sea salt sprays, utility bombs. It's versatility at its finest. All products are made with natural ingredients like coconut oil, sweet almond oil, and carefully chosen ingredients like shea butter to be safe for sensitive skin. Go outside your comfort zone and start with these products every single morning. And you'll see that creating a grooming routine is all good. You can literally take your athletic greens, use Owl and Co. Grooming, and then go on with your day. It's perfect. Owl and Co. Grooming is all about helping you find a grooming routine free from complications. So visit them on the web, owlandcogrooming.com or Instagram, Owl and Co. Grooming. 
Go now because you're listening to Locked On Senators. Use Senators 15 and get 15% off your next order. Senators 15 gets you 15% off at owlandcogrooming.com. All right, Pilsy. It's Locked On Senators for Tuesday, May 30th. No music today. I'm sad too. It gets us in the zone. We'll be back to that. The roadcaster is uh, day-to-day with a lower body Injury. Everybody needs a break once in a while, right? Everybody. Rest the weapon. If I hear that one more time, I'll go crazy. We are going to ask Pierre Dorian tomorrow what his favorite quote is. What does he think <laughs> is most quotable thing where he got home that day? He's like, oh, yeah, they're, they're going to pick up on that one. Yeah. That's got to be up there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be interesting to hear uh, that. And, uh, I mean, last summer was a huge summer for the Ottawa Senators, but this – like the follow-up on a big summer is almost as important, right? Like if you have a big summer and then next off season, you kind of don't do much, it doesn't help you. So this is going to be another big step for Pierre Dorian. I'm fired up about this interview and a chance to talk. Anytime you get a chance to talk to a general manager, it's fascinating because what these guys do is insane. Yes. We've had one general manager on the show and one president, right? President. Oh, yeah. um, from Cape Breton. I'm blanking on his name. Gerard Shaw. Yeah, it wasn't going to help you there. That's awesome. No, you got it. through that. Yeah, no, Pierre Dorian coming up tomorrow on Locked On Senders. Really excited to have a conversation with him. Much like with a head coach, I think it's great to do it in the summer yeah. when they're not in the daily grind because they get so locked in. Think about it from early September. Not saying that they aren't in the summer because in a GM's world, the draft is equally as important as anything you do in the in the uh, regular season but we're excited to have Pierre Dorian on tomorrow to pick up that conversation though in Ian Mendez's athletic fan survey they have Tyler Clevin as the highest voted player to play with Eric Brandstrom on the bottom pair that's a lot of inexperience if you ask me I thought they handled themselves well in the short sample size they had this year hell Everyone's numbers were a little bit better when they played with Branstrom than with other guys in the lineup. But I just see that as something where you can go to it during the season. If the situation calls for it, if injuries happen, whatever the case may be, but that's not what I'm starting training camp with. No. And Ross, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know how uh, businesses have those big stamps that they put on papers on that answer. I got a big stamp. Boom recency bias on that and <laughs> that's not to put anything against tyler clevin but i think that's a massive recency bias uh statement there or was that survey done prior when was that survey done after the season okay so yes boom my stamp continues recency bias well i'm gonna throw this back to you you're dj smith it's day one of training camp how are your d pairs gonna shape up in day one so we know we've already stamp of approval chikrin shabbat Mm -hmm. Sanderson Zub. That's mm -hmm. how you start. Period. Yes. Period. Period. Mm -hmm. How do you shape up the next, let's say, two, if not three pairs? So, uh, under the assumption that Travis Hamannick is coming back. Yeah. For so, this... at, at, yeah. And I want you to consider JBD and Branch from the RFAs in the mix as well. Yes. Uh, Mateen Paolo's got to be in here somewhere, too. Yep. But if I'm DJ Smith and if I know anything about DJ Smith, He's going to start with Hamnick as the inside track. Like one of these young guys, and as as he should, I don't blame him. I think that's yeah. the right move. So to answer your question, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, by the way, uh, Pierre Dorian was on Cam and Strix podcast today, St. Louis Bay. So out of mark, it'd be a lot different than our interview. Uh, he says that Jack Capuano in the locker room, people chirp him saying that Travis Hamnick is the son he never had. So <laughs> talk I mean, about they, inside track. They were together in New York, no? Yes, with the Islanders. Yeah, okay, that's what I figured. Um, so top four, we already said that's that's cleaned up. Eric Branson and Travis Hamnick is is my next pair. And then I mean I guess you go Clevin JBD and then Matim Paolo with one of the AHL veteran left left shot he guys. Hetherington? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know what this this all just symbolized? There's no room for Lassie Thompson anymore here. Nope. I Well, I really think it would be beneficial for both parties to move on. 
I think try to try to get some sort of draft capital move move up in the draft. What is last Thompson worth on the market? I'm not sure, but there there simply is no room left, and he hasn't made the jump quick enough. And I would rather put my bets on JBD finding a roster spot than Lassie. And that's not because I don't believe in Lassie. I think he can be a great player. I just think in Ottawa, it's not going to work. Yeah. So Matthew and Paolo as well, the way that we're kind of looking at this, he's kind of your, your sixth or fifth guy on the right side of the D chart right now. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just going to cap friendly right now to see if the contract is finalized. So this is the interesting thing. His minor salary is only 80 K. So and no waivers. And no waivers. So if he goes down to Belleville, I, I I don't know this, but I would assume 80K is less than what he was making as a as a player in Liga. So that would be a pay cut for him. And he's got, he's got to accept that that's something that could happen. So I wonder if this move by Matin Paolo and his agents is like, hey, let's get you to North America. Maybe you get a chance to make the NHL. This isn't about the money. This is about can we get you set up for the future? So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him. But I really think he's he's behind Hamannick and JBD there. Yeah, and again, Hamannick UFA pending. We'll see what happens next with him. Coming up in a couple of weeks, we are going to do the long promised cap restructuring oh boy. episode where a couple math guys here will do our best to shake shimmy and make sense of the Senators' upcoming cap situation. We might have to reach out to my good friend Mike Kelly from NHL Network and try to get him on to really dot the I's, cross the T's, and and let us know what's going on here because there's obviously the cloud hanging over of a $9 million qualifying offer to Alex DeBrinkett. That needs to be figured out before the draft. And again, the qualifying offers are 48 hours after the Stanley Cup final. Hell, and then Alex, they have two weeks to accept or deny it. And Alex Formanton, is he going to be qualified again? And this time, if he's qualified, does he just take it no matter what, knowing that they're not going to negotiate? There's no idea what's going to happen with that. I'm yeah. writing it off as though Alex Formanton is not a part of the organization going. I don't forward. even think they qualify him, Ross. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But again, nothing's come out. We'll see. But the investigation's been ongoing. He hasn't played in the National Hockey League in a year a long time since he's been in the national hockey league so with all that said the decor is what we want to discuss today so let us know in the comments who gets the inside track on the third pairing with eric branstrom or are you going to go galaxy brain say you trade branstrom this summer and then what are you doing on the third pair because i know i have seen that floated out there are people very divisive on eric branstrom but i think that the team is better with him in the lineup chikrin has had injury concerns in the past. Thomas Shabbat hasn't finished a season in the last three years. I think you keep Eric Branstrom as that insurance policy as a puck mover. Yeah, if you're asking me, trading Branstrom would be such a mistake. Like First round pick, though, I'm doing that all day. If you can get a first round pick in this draft, you don't have a first, second, or third, you're making that trade. I don't know if I agree. Oh, I'm putting up a poll on Twitter right now. Yeah, do it. I don't know if I agree because the thing, and I, and I had this rant uh, a couple weeks ago. I forget what episode it is, but it was with Meth. It was with Meth. I made my argument to, to him. The reason Eric Brandstrom is so important to the Ottawa Senators is because of his versatility and he's going to help you fit under the cap. He's a restricted free agent, so the Senators still have all the leverage. It's not like he had a massive season with points. He has good advanced analytics, and he can play, for my money, he can play on all six spots on this decor. Small small sample size, of course. I don't want him top pair defenseman for 80 games. He can play on any power play. He can play on any penalty kill. He can play the left or the right side. We d- already talked about it. He His analytics with every player is better with them. That It's not worse with any player. So... I just think his value is so huge. And what's the point of letting go of a young defenseman that you have team control over just so you can draft another defenseman that hopefully pans out and can make the NHL in a a couple of years? For me, that doesn't help. 
you're making your playoff chances worse next year if you trade Eric Branson for a first round pick. Yeah, I think that's fair unless you believe that Tyler Clevin is ready to step in and be a third pair NHL defenseman. The the overwhelming majority would do it. Early returns, 40 votes in, 90% would would make that trade. It's a first round pick and I think that the fact Ottawa doesn't have a second, third or first this year and the prospect pool has graduated a lot of its talent. I think they're kind of like, hey, could we replace a third a third pair defenseman in free agency a little bit easier than getting a first round quality player? But I feel like calling Bransom a third pair defenseman isn't exactly fair to him because he's not a guy that numbers don't lie. He's not a look at the advanced analytics. Um, he's not a guy that you're not moving up the lineup. Like if someone gets hurt, it's not like you're like, well, crap, we can't move Randy up because he can. Yeah. And he plays good with everyone. And he can play both sides. But also not to not to be a pole poacher on you, Ross. I know you hate the people that do this, but a first round pick is very vague. Like if we're talking top 15, okay, that's, that's a very different story. Now, do I think he could get that? No. But if you're talking about the 32nd pick in the first round, that – that's very different from a mid-teens or early 20s. Yeah, Andrew writes in saying, if it's in the 22 to 32 range, no. 15 to 21, I consider it top 15, no-brainer. Spencer writes okay, in. Okay, boom. That, I, I'm exactly on, on that uh, approach. Because when you said a first-rounder, I'm thinking about a team that made the playoffs and is just looking to add a, a good young defenseman to help out their cap. So I wasn't anticipating it would be in the teens. Draft. Just to clarify Draft month starts Thursday on Locked On Senators. For that reason, I do it. Also, I would draw the line at 25th. I would trade Branson for 24th overall in, in this upcoming draft. Okay. It's a deep draft, and the Sense prospect pool could use a first-round talent. I'm putting my number at 20. Okay. I'll if, say it's, if it's 20 or closer to 32, no thanks. Higher than 20. I'll, I'll probably do that. Branstrom is also going to be 24 at training camp. So that means he has what, two years left, three years left until unrestricted free agency. So that's you're great. also buying time. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's the thing is we can't have this mindset of, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm saying the fan base in general, we can't have this mindset of let's get the picks. Let's get as much draft capital as possible. Because but we just talked. They have too many defensemen for the amount of spots they have. So you got to move someone. And if Lassie yeah. Thompson's going to get you a fourth round pick or you're going to get a first. Now, I don't think this is a realistic scenario, but it's May 30th and we're talking Sens hockey. So let's have some fun with it. Why don't we? Yep. Let's have more of this argument on the other side. we got to hit a quick break. We'll talk on this and a Stanley Cup preview next. You're listening to Locked on Senators. All right, Pilsy. Heated debate here on Locked On Senators. Eric Branstrom, if you're offered a first round pick, do you do it? You were going off on why you would not. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I'm I'm looking at this poll now, and I, I think <laughs> the clarification needs to be said. Like well, I'm trying to find that comment because that's the yeah, so it, from Andrew here, I think that's that's the correct approach. Um yes. There's, we're talking about we have too many defensemen. You got to move one of them. But I believe Eric Brandstrom's value. There we go. Eric Brandstrom's value to the Ottawa Senators is more than his league wide value. Like remember, remember that athletic poll they did polling executives. I, I forget when this was. It was quite a while ago, probably over a year ago. But they floated the idea of Eric Brandstrom being traded, and NHL executives laughed at that. They were like. This guy has no value around the league. So if that's the case, like, I don't even, I think this discussion is kind of a moot point because I don't think a team would trade a first round pick for Branstrom. I know, but this is hypothetical season, right? No, here. I know that. I know that. But what I'm saying is that's, that's why I'm not really interested in trading Branstrom because the, <laughs> the value is not going to be there. Why do I think? Yep, <laughs> liked by Brandon Peller. We can watch it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, let's get us back here. We're still working out the Hello. kinks with the production here on Locked On Senators YouTube. Should we ask Pierre Dory on that tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a fun interview with him. He is always very honest, open, all that great stuff. Hey, last time we asked him, 
what's the one move you regret or yeah. what's the one move that was the hardest move to make. And he said, Mark Stone, you know what? He actually expanded on that with Cam mm-hmm. and Strick today saying that he recommended to Eugene Melnick that they give him eight years at what he wanted. How would the Sens organization be different if they had given Mark Stone an eight-year contract? What was the rumor? He wanted like eight by 8.5, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember what the rumor was. It was less than he signed for in Vegas at 9.5. It was Yeah, he was willing to take a discount. I do know that. Um, I think it was 8.5. I... And... (laughs) The Branstrom return was worth it. I don't care about no. That's hey, not where funny, I'm going. funny. We went from talking about Branstrom <laughs> to yeah. Um, that, no, that's not where I'm going with this. But I do think it was the right move to let Stone go. Now it pains me to say that, but the Senators weren't at a position where keeping Mark Stone and paying him that much made sense. And again, as much as it pains me to say, allowing Mark Stone to leave allowed Brady to take over this team. Now, that's not to say that Brady and Mark Stone couldn't have led this team together in some sort of way. I'm not I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying it made it clear who's the guy, who's the man. It's Brady. And that's a big contract for Mark Stone. And when you have back injuries like that, that scares me a little bit. So I think it ended up working out for the Sens. Am I disappointed by the return? Yeah. I think you could easily look at the Pacioretty trade and say the Habs got a better deal for Pacioretty. Um, and that's disappointing for sure. But I don't think it was the right move at the right time. And I think they they had to let him go. I just wonder how different the, the Sens organization would be. if Because then another thing I'm thinking of, Ross, is if Stone stays there, this team is better, but they don't, I don't think they make the playoffs necessarily. So your draft well, and does, position does Clo- wouldn't have been as good as right winger Claude Giroux come. If Mark Stone's already in the top six on the right side, like there's yep. just so many dominoes that would fall. But at the same time, man, Mark Stone only has like, he's already on his fifth year of this contract. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's crazy. It's been that long, but what are the games played on those years? Well, great. I mean, during the regular season, maybe not. During the playoffs, we already talked about it. He's played 63. He's almost played a full regular season worth of playoff games since he got traded to Vegas. Yes, but the Senators would not have made the playoffs in most of those seasons. And if he's not there in the regular season, extra reason the Senators would not have made the playoffs. Yeah, only 43 games this year, 37 last year. But he did play 55 out of 56 games during the COVID-shortened uh, season. But yeah, you got to think. And that's what Dorian was saying with, with Melnick being like, hey, when we're going to be competitive, those last couple of years of his contract might be the ones that you look at the production not being where the value of the deal is. And that's when they're going to be in their window. But it was interesting to hear Pierre open up about that. And again, it just makes me think even further about what we're going to ask Pierre tomorrow, because I think we're going to get him very candid. I really do. I think he's in a spot where he's kind of reflecting on the last six years of being on the job and with the new ownership coming, all that great stuff. He mentioned that all of his buddies have been playing Snoop Dogg on their golf carts uh, when they're out right now. So Good interview. Definitely recommend checking that out with Cam and Strick and then checking out Pierre Dorian here tomorrow on the show. The reason I bring up Mark Stone is because he is heading to the Stanley Woo. Cup Finals. Congratulations to Mark Stone, a guy who we're always going to cheer for. Ever since I was at the game where he it was Mark Stone again against Pittsburgh during the Hamburglar run where it really felt like the house of cards was crumbling down. He comes out there, scores a goal during the game. Then in overtime, he gets the game winner. And they were down 3-0. Crosby scored 10 seconds into the game. I was like, man, did I just mush the Hamburglar (laughs) single-handedly? Like, I've mushed McDonald's burgers. You made it a smash burger. That's usually so I can stack two on top of the other. (laughs) That's when I mush (laughs) the Hamburglars. But uh, in all seriousness, it'll be Mark Stone in the Stanley Cup Final with Michael Amadio as well, sends abroad, against... Colin White and Anthony Duclair, postcast contributor. Jack Richardson made a good point. That was Brady Kachuk's line in 2018-19. It was Colin White between Brady Kachuk and Mark Stone. Those two are in the Stanley Cup Finals. But my real question, and kind of tongue-in-cheek, family over everything, but Brady Kachuk's got his his first ever landlord in one side. (laughs) A guy, he was in Mark Stone's wedding party. Yep. And then you've got his brother on the other side. And obviously the relationship he has with not only Colin White, but Anthony Duclair 
as well. I think that probably outweighs it. But it is going to be kind of a cool series from a sense st- fan standpoint because not only would Mark Stone be winning the cup, Pilsy, he would be the one who would be going to get it from Gary Bettman. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I would, I just pictured that in my head, and that, I, I would love that. Like, I think I would probably even get a little emotional watching that Ross because uh, Stone meant so much to this franchise, and he's just one of those guys that I feel like he has the respect around the league, and and. He, he's a real he's a gamer as uh, Paul Maurice would say and maybe apart from Jamie Ben who didn't show him a lot of respect uh, in that series uh, I would say uh, league-wide he's a very well-liked guy so or PK would, Subban the micro fracture in 2015 PK Subban uh, take doing his best Paul Bunyan uh, <laughs> impersonation um, but this or hey, or Max Domi the same game as Jamie Ben yeah true True, exactly. Um, this is going to be a good series, though, Ross. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with my prediction here. I'm going Vegas in six. And the reason I'm going Vegas is, and we'll tie this back to Ottawa, the Florida Panthers have been hungry dogs. They've been, I mean, cats. They're, they're the cats, but uh, they've been hungry underdogs this whole playoffs. And they fed off that. They love that. They've been battling. They've been grinding, um, beating one of the best regular season teams ever. Then the Leafs make the second playoffs. They beat them too. Then you have a conference final and they get the sweep. But now they're just hanging out. Matthew Kachuk is going to heat games, talking to Shaquille O'Neal, and he's just chilling. And that team is just chilling. And I think that's they're going to lose their edge because of that. And I think ultimately – that's going to play a big part in this team not being able to stay as hungry. Now, can they get that edge back? Yeah, but I think the first two games, you're going to see a bit of that. I don't want to say lackadaisical, but they're not going to have that same hunger. And I know uh, Elliot Friedman always talks about how the rest is actually really good for the Panthers because uh, Sergei Bobrovsky is kind of on a load management type schedule, so that helps him. But I don't know. I think this Vegas team... It's the team of misfits that were cast away by their teams. I mean, all of them. Like, look at the stories here. Like, the expansion draft guys we know about the Carlsons, the Marshall Shows, the Riley Smiths. Their stories are etched in stone. Um, And then Mark Stone. He wanted to be the captain of this team. He wanted to take a discount to sign long-term. They said, nope, we're not doing it. We're shipping you out. Jack Eichel. First time in the playoffs. He makes a cup final. First time in the playoffs. Makes a cup final. Buffalo. They're throwing tomatoes and fruit at him as he's leaving the door and they boo him every time he comes in. He's hated by the team that he put so much blood, sweat, and tears into. And he got Petrangelo. He's a captain in St. Louis. They finally get a cup. And what do they do? Get out of here. So, like, these guys have such chips on their shoulders and have banded together so well that I know the Florida team is defying all odds, but I kind of get team of destiny odds from Vegas here. So... I'm going Vegas in six. What's your prediction? Are you feeling better about your Winnipeg uh, Stanley Cup final pick because the team that beat them made it to the final? Yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll take that. Um, how, <laughs> picking a team to go to the finals that don't make it out of the first round is tough. They won so one I'll game. That. I, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the first game. <laughs> yeah. And Ross, I was so close to to stomping oh. on the haters and tweeting oh, yeah. out like Vegas or Vegas doesn't look so good. Now. Go Jets, go Jets. I'm glad I, I held off that. You know me. I usually don't roll around in the mud on Twitter. This, these are reasons why. So I did not roll in the mud and I stayed clean. Although oh. I did just spill coffee on my shirt. So staying clean. <laughs> oh, exactly whatever. Correct. You saw your positive Pillsy shirt. So it's all no. good. Uh, my pick is the Florida Panthers. Let's go. I'm on the bandwagon. They're plus 130 at FanDuel. I'm mm-hmm. all in on the Florida Panthers. I love the story. I love the way they play. And we saw it like Winnipeg's more of a, a possession team. They're not going to kind of run you through the boards. Same like, I don't know. I, I just feel like with the Vegas Golden Knights this postseason, they've been great. Don't get me wrong. And it's going to hinge on Sergey Bobrovsky, right? Like, That's what it's going to come down to. That's the last two series came down to. But who would bet against him at this point? He's just shown over and over again that he he is the best goalie in the playoffs right now. And I'm looking at the Vegas Golden Knights. Yeah, Aiden Hill, nice little clean shutout. They actually got two shutouts in that series against Dallas. But, I mean, you're looking at a Panthers team that's already beaten the best team in the league this year with points. 
the second best team with points, and the fourth best team in the league in terms of points. What's left? How about the best team in the West? That's who they've got next. This is yep. what this team does. They go in as the David versus Goliath. They're just there. Hey, no pressure. Happy to be here. And I have to say, I'm so jealous for the people of South Florida. Did you see the schedule versus the NBA Finals? They have a championship game to watch between the Miami Heat and Florida Panthers every, every day. single oh, day, awesome. starting June 3rd, Thursday, or sorry. June 3rd, uh, Saturday, I think. So starting Friday, starting Friday, the June 2nd, the, the NHL starts Saturday, the NBA starts Friday. From Friday for a week and a half, they have a championship game to watch every single night. Unreal. Can't relate. Like, this. <laughs> really cannot relate. Yeah. Like, what would be the equivalent? Like, the Senators are in and, and what? Like, there's no even other sports. Like, the Red Blacks have a preseason game that night. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the Ottawa Blackjacks? Nope, that's a summer league too, the CEBL. Yeah, no, can't relate. Well, how, how many games? How many games this series? I'm taking Florida in six. six okay. Winning yeah. at home. Oh, if it goes to Vegas, in Vegas, game seven. Although, isn't Florida unbeaten? Are they unbeaten on the road this postseason? I'm saying that was They zero. might be. No, they might be. I'm saying that was no, zero. No, Boston confidence. must have won one. On the road. Wait. <laughs> they lost game one at Boston. Yeah. Okay. And have not lost on the road since. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. 6 3 win, 4 3 overtime, 4 3 overtime, 4 2, 3 2, 4, uh, 3 2 in four overtimes, and 2 1 in overtime. That's the road record for but the Florida Panthers. Ross. They have. They have five road overtime wins this postseason. But is that good or bad? They're battle tested. But they were this close so many times. Um, but what I'll say, and uh, this is no disrespect to the Boston Bruins or no disrespect to the Carolina Hurricanes, much disrespect to the Toronto Leafs fans. Home ice in Vegas is different. I went to a game a couple of years ago and – that was a regular season game up against the San Jose Sharks, who they actually weirdly have a, a, a rivalry up against, especially the Twitter rivalry is kind of funny to watch. But that barn was electric. And for the Stanley Cup Finals, it's going to be hard to play there. So I'll be interested to see if Florida can keep those uh, road battles going in their favor because Vegas is it's crazy. It is, it is. So I'm taking the Panthers in six. You got Vegas in six. Should we do a mayor's bet? Some sort of mayor's bet here or what? I don't have anything. I don't know, for, I don't know if we're that attached to these teams. No, because I, I would be really happy to see the Stanley Cup go to Mark Stone. I know Sens fans kind of have maybe mixed feelings about that, but I, I think it'd be awesome. No, who's, what Sens fans have mixed feelings about that? I've seen it online. Lame. Yeah. But it, like, it would be pretty cool to see Colin White lift the uh, the old trophy too. <laughs> Why you would drop it? He'd oh, be the guy that would drop it. Pick it up. He'd try to drink out of the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know people in Winnipeg do not want Florida to win because it just kind of magnifies that hey, the coach that left wasn't the problem. Uh, if they don't know that. Yeah, already. by now, then they got issues already. I mean, Paul Maurice, honestly, uh, Ross might be one top three coaches in the league for me. I love Paul Maurice. I think, like, this guy's been coaching since his 30s. Wasn't he a coach of the Hartford Whalers in his 30s? His 20, 29 when he got his first head coaching job. So 20s, yeah. He's been around, and he's just so intelligent, and he really feels, it really feels like he's a guy that, you know, uh, Jeff Merrick always says coaches need to know when to, you know, give a guy a pat on the back or whether to give him a smack on the ass to get him going. Like you need to know how to work certain guys and when to push what buttons. And no one has more experience than him, really. I can't think of a coach that has more experience than him, like uh, active. No, no. Like no all time games coached in, in the NHL. He's right up there. He's got the most losses all time. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm serious. Hey, no, I don't believe it. But it also just means that, that you've coached the most. He he has 712 losses 
in the uh, in the NHL. He's uh, fourth in most games coached. His next regular season game will tie him with Joel Quenville for third, behind only Barry Trotz and Scotty, and Scotty Bowman. Bowman. Scotty Bowman has 2141. That's yeah. 300 more than anybody else. Tw- and get this, he also has 1244 wins. Yeah. Yeah, Scotty Bowman's absurd. an absolute legend. Yeah. Which is absurd. Absurd. Uh, but yeah, Paul Maurice, I mean, yeah, a lot of games, a lot of experience, and that team looks pretty dialed in here. And you're right, though. That's a long layoff. It'll be about 11, 11 days they're going to be off. That's a long um, time. Yeah. Well, what did you want them to do? Lose games on purpose? <laughs> Final thoughts on today's show? Final thoughts on today's show? Uh... Ownership coming Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, my final thoughts is have some fun. Ken Warren, the writer for the Ottawa Citizen, replied to our poll discussing would you trade Eric Brandstrom if you're offered a 2023 first? Who is ever offering a first round pick for Eric Brandstrom? Ken, it's May 30th. Have some fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. This this whole thing is kind of moot because I don't think it's a hypothetical that would happen, but I, I, will, I will entertain this idea though i said it's may 30th ken let's use our elite sense brains for a moment <laughs> yeah all right uh excited for tomorrow pierre dorian on the show senators gm lots to discuss with him if you have a question you want us to ask put it in the youtube comments yes. we will check those and put a list out and maybe we'll present it to him like Hey, uh, so we we asked these little first graders to, yeah. to ask a question. That way, we take any bite out of them. It's like, hey, they're just honest little kids. You're not yeah, going to give them an honest answer. Timmy from Mrs. White's third grade class at uh, Jack Layton Elementary School. I, I, I thought you. This. I thought you were going to say Timmy from Veers in uh, Germany wants to know. <laughs> little, little Timmy wants to know. Um, can you give him a raise? Cause he's underpaid already and his contract hasn't started. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, uh, sorry. Actual final thoughts for me, Ross is I picked up the reverse retro Jersey from the send store. If you guys are looking for that 75 bucks for a Jersey now only today, only today. Yeah. I wanted to stay true to me getting a Brown Jersey. I told people I would do that. The customization was not part of the sale. So I was not able to do that. I yeah, apologize. that's too bad. I'll I'll do like one of those homemade name bars. That's what we need for it. All right. Yeah, I'm down for that. All right. We'll chat tomorrow for Brandon Piller. I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. <laughs>